One of the problems in the early years of our understanding of evolution was that the theory predicted intermediate forms between species, specifically between apes and man, and evidence of these forms was missing. The same problem applies in our understanding of early Christianity, because early Christian theology emerged fully formed in Paul, and this theology was a major, not a minor, departure from the Jewish theology from which it had apparently evolved. The question has been addressed by asserting that only a single theological mutation was needed to change from Judaism to Christianity, the replacement of regular sacrifices with one high-value sacrifice. Christian protestations notwithstanding, that single mutation theory will not survive even a fairly cursory inspection, let alone one of any depth. The differences between Jewish and Christian theology are numerous and major, and apply to all eras, from before the first Jewish covenant, to between the Jewish covenant and the origin of Christianity, and thereafter. Religions are about trying to control human behaviour, so they require systems that promote one kind of behaviour and discourage another. These are the reward and sin management systems, and as with earthly governments, it's the sin management part of the deal that is the dominant one. There are other systems like financial and temporal power structures, and most religions, including the Abrahamics, have a system that promotes closer relationships between believers and their gods. These include means of worship, meditation, enlightenment, etc., and I will call these proximity systems. The supposed point mutation that took Judaism to Christianity was located in the sin management system. We are told by Christians that Jewish sin management was by regular animal sacrifice as atonement and that this was changed to a single high-value sacrifice. All the rest follows. The fallacy here is a fundamental one, because in Judaism, sacrifices were in the proximity system, not sin management. Sacrifice is a long and complex history. It was practised by most ancient peoples, including the Israelites and those around them. Its origin is not clear, but it may have started as a meal shared with departed family members who were offered the choicest cuts of meat, as relics of this still survive into the Mosaic Code. Animal replacement of human sacrifice is another possible origin. Human sacrifice was widely practised and many traces of it remain in the Old Testament, primarily in the prophets railing against the practices of the Israelites' neighbours, but also traces of its being used by the Israelites themselves. Early in the evolution of sacrifices, they were used to try to entreat gods to do what was seen to be within their power, such as benefit crops and rain and assist with military campaigns, cure illness, etc., the Mosaic Code made them a regular part of worship, which was a system intended to bring the people closer to God, the proximity system. Sin does have a bearing on proximity to God, just as wronging another person has a bearing on your proximity to them. To re-establish proximity requires that wrongs are righted first, and so in most forms of Judaism, when you sin, the sin management system must be satisfied first – if and only if that system has been satisfied, can the proximity system be invoked to give thanks to God for affording forgiveness and show successful sin management to the community. Sin management was fairly straightforward. You had to repent and ask God for forgiveness, but there was a catch. You had to mean it. God could read your mind and if you did not mean it, he would know. The repent first, sacrifice second order was not universal though. The Mosaic sacrificial system is explained in Leviticus and there are two sacrifices in particular that are used by Christians to justify their theology. The first is the sin offering. This is an offering for unintentional sins, for example if some confusion arose between the turkey and ham sandwiches. The system varies depending on who has sinned, be it the high priest, the Sanhedrin or a commoner. For this offering, repentance is assumed to be a prerequisite, but it's not actually stated to precede the sacrifice and forgiveness is given by the high priest after it, in Leviticus 4. The second relevant sacrifice is the guilt offering. This is also offered for unintentional sins, as well as for a limited list of intentional sins, including dishonesty such as embezzlement or theft. For the guilt offering to work, 
These sins must be admitted freely without the perpetrator being caught and any money they have taken must be repaid with a 20% surcharge. That's distinct from the usual restitution for theft when somebody has been caught, which is a 100% surcharge. The sin and guilt offerings are similar and they probably represent versions of the same thing coming to Leviticus from the southern Judaic and northern Israelite traditions. Between the two sacrifices they only grant forgiveness for a restricted list of minor sins and do not have a role in freeing a person from sin altogether. However, the sin management, repentance and forgiveness scheme is all over the Old Testament. Just a couple of examples. In Jonah, the city of Nineveh became so wicked that God decided it was time to intervene. He sends a rather unworthy and backsliding prophet, Jonah, to tell them if they don't mend their ways, destruction awaits. Jonah tries to escape from God but unsuccessfully. He's retrieved from the waves by a great fish that spews him on the beach and eventually he makes his way to Nineveh and starts his preaching. What happens then is key to the story because Nineveh goes into repentance mode. They bring out the sackcloth and ashes and lament their wicked ways. They get forgiven. Destruction is averted and Jonah gets ticked off because he wanted them all killed. There are many other examples, but one more is David who schemes to have a loyal and worthy soldier, Uriah, killed so that he can possess his wife from 2 Samuel 11. He sees Bathsheba bathing on the roof for purity after her period, so we know that she was not pregnant then. He sends for her and sleeps with her and she gets pregnant. He was perhaps a bit unlucky there because she should have been in the safe period, but anyway, he tries to get Uriah to sleep with her to cuckold him. But Uriah is too worthy to do so, even after David gets him drunk. So David sends a letter, with Uriah if you please, back to the front, instructing General Joab to rig a battle to have Uriah killed. God is not pleased and threatens all sorts of punishments and humiliations to David. God is not pleased and threatens all sorts of punishments and humiliations to David who repents without giving a sacrifice. God does relent, but he still strikes the child with illness and it dies. But Bathsheba's fertility is again confirmed and Solomon eventually arrives. A weakness in this sin management system meant that you could exploit the social benefits of apparent piety without real repentance and with every intention of carrying on sinning. Not surprisingly, the prophets repeatedly railed against this. They did not come down against sacrifice but were clear that it was an adjunct rather than a replacement for repentance. It does seem to have been rather widely used as an outward show of pseudo-repentance Just take a look at Amos 4 and 5 to see God's view of insincere sacrifice. Here in Amos 5.21, I hate and loathe your festive offerings. I will not be appeased by your assemblies, for even if you offer up to me burnt offerings and your meal offerings, I will not be appeased and I will not regard your peace offering from your fatlings. By the first century, the prophets had had their say leading to possible interpretations of the sacrifice system that ranged from one end, where generally repentance was required for the forgiveness of sins, but sacrifice alone would do for a subgroup, to where repentance and forgiveness were always required first and only then could sacrifice be offered as an option. We don't know where the various Jewish groups stood on this in the first century, but we can infer. The Sadducees were in control of the temple, the only place where sacrifice could be offered. So if anybody believed in sacrifice first, it would be them. They, of course, did not believe in resurrection. Other groups, like the Pharisees and the Essenes, did not have direct access to temple sacrifice and therefore would presumably have been on the repentance first, sacrifice optional later end of the spectrum. This puts additional impediments in the way of any of these groups evolving into Christianity the Sadducees because they did not believe in resurrection, and the other groups because they appeared to have believed that repentance and forgiveness did not depend on sacrifice. That being so, it seems unlikely that the Christian sacrificial system arose out of Judaism in one step. Perhaps it could have arisen out of the very thing the prophets were railing against, in which case future prophets would have had plenty to say about it. 
The idea that the origin of Christianity dates back to the destruction of the temple and therefore the loss of the means of redemption is also not true because the Jewish religion had a contingent that has been used since and that was previously used during the Babylonian exile. So that's the first difference. Altering the sin management system from repentance to sacrifice requires multiple changes, not just one. <clears throat> Another difference is that the sin management substitution system alone is not enough, as Jesus' sacrifice would not have a, given a pleasing aroma to the Lord. Sacrifices could only be offered in the temple and had to be burnt. Further, the animal had to be unblemished and it could not be unclean. By no reading of the Mosaic Code can human meat be seen as kosher. Another required difference is that the God of Judaism is not limited in what he can forgive, whereas the God of Christianity is. He is unable to waive the requirement for blood sacrifice before forgiveness. Currently, Christians couch this as a universal law of justice and that God is required to follow it because he is just. It could originally have been because some other god who outranked the original Christian god demanded it. Either way, the god of Christianity cannot do something that the god of Judaism can do, so is the less powerful. And that thing that he can't do, to forgive without sacrifice, is pretty important. Then there is vicarious atonement. This is another major change. It is facilitated by the substitution of blood sacrifice for repentance. After all, if you owe a debt of money, it can be paid off by somebody else. If you owe a sacrifice, the sacrificial animal could presumably be bought by somebody else and given to you for the purpose. So, sacrificial atonement naturally lends itself to vicarious atonement when somebody else pays the price for your sin. But this is not true of repentance. It is true that a community can collectively repent but one individual cannot repent on the behalf of another, nor can one community repent on behalf of another. There are mentions in the Old Testament that are interpreted by some as indicating vicarious atonement, Isaiah 53 being one, the famed suffering servant chapter. Verse 4, But in truth it was our ills that he bore and our pains that he carried, but we had regarded him as diseased and stricken by God and afflicted, he was pained because of our rebellious sin and oppressed through our iniquities. The chastisement upon him was for our benefit and through his words we were healed. The Jonathan Targum was originally written by Jonathan ben Uziel around the turn of the first century but repeatedly edited over several centuries. This gives a paraphrase of Isaiah that was used in the first century to read in synagogues and unambiguously identifies the suffering servant with the Messiah. But the Targum removes his suffering and alters vicarious atonement from he suffered for us to he prayed for us. A strength of the Bible is that whatever it is that you want, you will find it if you look hard enough, and that is what we see here. Isaiah does not say the chastisement upon him was for our benefit and God accepted his suffering as atonement for our sins. Does that mean some first century Jews may have believed in vicarious atonement? They may have, and that belief could have contributed to Christianity, but this is pure speculation. Yet another theological difference is the idea of universal sinning, later to become original sin introduced by Paul in Romans 3.22. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. This was necessary to give Christianity exclusive control over salvation, and in particular to deny a route to it via Judaism. Individually, these are each major theological obstacles to changing a religion, far greater than the theological obstacles we're familiar with from other cases. For example, none of these obstacles apply to the difference between Judaism and Islam. And similarly, the schisms that have occurred within Christianity were mainly about temporal church organisation and authority, with only minor theological differences arising. Three modern Christian denominations have their own word of God brought to them by their own prophets. I call them the Christianity plus religions. They tend to have particularly divergent theologies. 
They are the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons and the Seventh-day Adventists. They add complex narratives about goings-on in the heaven and hell and some differences about later Christian ideas such as the Trinity, the state of the dead and the fate of you and me, us being the wicked. But even these are not remotely comparable to Paul's innovations. So what happened? For one person to invent a highly novel theology is of course possible, but history shows that that is not sufficient. A population who already believe in another religion have to be convinced. Even though there was a schism between Paul and the Jerusalem church, there was at least at some point a reconciliation between them, which is hard to credit if Paul's divergence was as wide as it appears. It seems more likely that there is another explanation, of which there are essentially two possibilities, both being speculative. One is that the divergence between Christianity and Judaism occurred over a longer time with more steps than is apparent from the New Testament. The other is that Christianity is a syncretism between Judaism and some other unknown religion. The conventional view is that Jesus' followers were so devoted to him that when he was killed they could not abandon him as a false messiah and came up with all of these convoluted theological gymnastics purely to facilitate his apotheosis. If they were, as we're told, ignorant peasants and fishermen, maybe they had so little theological understanding of their own religion that they just didn't see any problem with that. But if so, how did they persuade Paul, who we are told had a theological education? On the other hand, the changes seem to have been made by Paul, and why would he have the motivation when he had never even known Jesus? And if he did know the Jewish religion and changed it so drastically, how on earth did he manage to get these changes accepted? The mythicist view is of a religion that arose from Judaism sometime before the first century and whose theorising regarding sacrifice transcended into the heavenly realm where the earthly mosaic rules were relaxed, allowing Jesus' sacrifice. That still doesn't get round the problem of repentance versus sacrifice for sin and note that the repentance theory seems to be the one favoured by the human mind as secular sin management systems are focused on restitution of wrongs and credit for repentance but not sacrifice. The syncretism idea is appealing, except for the lack of any credible religion to bring universal sinning, sacrificial sin management and limitations on God's powers to Judaism. Some form of Gnosticism might do, because of its extensive Christianity Plus-like imaginings of goings-on in the spirit realm, and its multiple gods limiting the power of each other, but Gnosticism seems to have appeared too late for such a syncretism. It is a major problem because, in essence, the Old and New Testaments are not about the same God.